Back Porch by Chris Offit. First to leave the plane, Ruby carried a large purse containing her medication, makeup, and billfold. A small canister of mace disguised as a keychain had gotten past the x-ray guards. She watched the young mother fasten a leash to a harness worn by a boy, and Ruby wondered if the woman let dogs run free in her home. Ruby had grown up deep in the country where the only barrier between nature and humanity were the walls of a house. She believed that allowing dogs indoors led directly to the acceptability of leashing a child. For the past 10 years, Ruby had lived in a retirement community outside of Albuquerque. No pets allowed. She had never married and had no children. She moved slowly along the gateway, passed by harried travelers talking loud into cell phones. Ruby remembered the eight family party line when she was a kid. So many people listened in that nobody spoke personally on a call, but used the phone to spread gossip up the hollers and out the ridges. A young man in a cheap suit leaned against a square pillar. He held a cardboard sign with large letters that said, Ruby Tanner. Ruby nodded to him, and he spoke with the chirpy tones of someone who'd spent so long attempting false cheer that it had grafted onto his voice. I'll get your luggage, Mrs. Tanner. Just point it out to me. It's Miss, not Mrs. I don't have any bags. Are you sure? Of course, I'm sure. What kind of question is that? Well, it's just that most people do, is all. I'm going home. I don't need a bunch of junk from off. Yes, ma'am. He led her toward the exit. Charlie had ferried enough old folks around to learn patience. He wanted the ride to go smoothly so she'd request him for her return trip to the airport. I've heard of Tanner's. You from Rowan County? I sure am. Biggest news we got is the old Haldeman grade school burned down here lately. Well, I went there, but I got a good alibi. <laughs> yeah, well, you might be the only one. <laughs> His laughter was a prepackaged sound designed to promote ease. Something was nagging at the boy, and Ruby stopped to take a good look. He was a pleasant enough young man, pocked and handsome with a delicate nose. His dark hair grew in sleek little kiss curls. He clearly liked to be the last to speak, not so much a know-it-all, but the serviceable sort of man who always felt compelled to respond. He was quick to please. She had always preferred them wild and reckless, with fast cars and loose cash, willing to love her tight for the moment. You're a nice young man. Thank you, ma'am. How old are you? Twenty-five. I'm seventy-five. Right between us is age fifty. And you know what I learned at fifty? I don't know. Not to worry so much? No, if you're a worrier by nature, it never goes away. Well, what then? The number of men I regretted sleeping with equaled the number of men I wished I'd slept with. She clamped her lips like two bricks to keep from smiling as she watched him blink, fidget, swallow, and finally stare at the floor while his entire head turned red. He opened his mouth but couldn't manage a stammer. She stepped close and touched his arm, making him flinch. Let's go to the car now. He nodded rapidly, and they walked past the baggage claim, where a couple of young boys were riding on the moving belt. She didn't figure her driver had ever done anything like that. He held the exit door open, and Ruby stepped into the enveloping humidity of Kentucky. She'd missed the thick way it filled her lungs. Breathing the air of home, was like slipping on a favorite sweater discovered in a forgotten box. She hoped it wouldn't melt her makeup, lathered on thick to conceal the slight jaundice brought on by her illness. A speaker concealed in a row of low trees began to issue a hideous recording of a tortured creature. What's all that racket? A dying bird. It's supposed to scare the other birds away from the trees. Make more sense not to plant trees, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yes, ma'am, but I, I reckon airport bosses don't have time to try and make sense to birds. 
Ruby nodded and he escorted her to the livery parking zone. The car was new and big and boxy, reminding her of a police car in New Mexico. He opened the rear door, but she ignored him and eased into the front seat, adjusting her body to accommodate a stabbing pain in her lower back. He closed the door and slid behind the wheel. What's your name? I'm Jim Tom Tucker's second boy, Charlie. My mother's people are Bowens. Ruby had gone to school with a Tucker that everyone called Furnace because he never wore a coat in winter. Quiet and tall, Fernie's wrist bones protruded like walnuts. Did you ever know a Fernie? He was behind me in school. He used to live up on the big road. You mean Gates? No, I'm pretty sure it was Fernie. Oh, they got all them roads named now. The big road's called Gates. Uh, but Fernie, he kin to you? Yes, ma'am. My great uncle. You knew him? Oh, only a little. He, uh... He hesitated, unsure of the protocol for informing a woman that someone younger than her had died of old age. As a boy, he'd never quite comprehended the aging process. He thought the elderly had always been that way, that Vietnam was fought by old men. They left the looping ribbons of airport asphalt and pulled onto Interstate 64. Ruby watched the land stream past, a solid smear of green as relentless as the western sun she'd left behind. She sipped water from a bottle in her purse. The sky was blue as old jeans. Ma'am, I know your flight got in from New Mexico. What's it like out there? Hot, but everybody's got the air conditioner turned up high, so you're cold half the time. Living in the desert means carrying a jacket to stay warm indoors. Life's awful everywhere, ain't it? People you love falling off one end while new ones are coming in the other. It was mainly just hot. The land began rising in gradually steeper furrows leading to the Pottsdale Escarpment, a gigantic dark cliff that marked the geologic entry to the Appalachian foothills. It had a foreboding quality, a warning to travelers that the world beyond was very different. Trees grew bigger, the undergrowth thicker, the shadows blacker. They crossed the Lickin' River. Trash hung in the low boughs of trees, arching onto the surface. Which exit? I don't know. I'll go with commercial. It's probably the oldest. How long since you've been back, Miss Tanner? Sixty years. The driver glanced at the interior mirror, thinking that he'd been born and raised and married in the time that she'd been gone. He wondered what it was like not to live in the hills. He felt sorry for her having to be gone so long from home. Are you all having a family reunion? In a way. Law. Our reunions are 300 people every June. I'm pretty much the only one left of us. Who are you planning to reunion with? Mainly the land. Well, that's the first exit to the lake. There's gobs of people come down from Lexington in the summer. Past town is a new exit. They chopped a road over Big Perry Hill right through the woods. Some people didn't like that. I reckon not. But you can't let nature run wild. <laughs> Ruby began to giggle. And he glanced at her, seeing mirth drain the age from her face. He was startled to realize how beautiful she must have been. He stiffened his back worried that he might have a trace of carnal thoughts. He'd always figured old people didn't enjoy sex, but when his papa started taking Viagra, his mamma's mood had lifted in general. He shook his head swiftly to eliminate such thoughts, causing the car to weave as he overcorrected. A car horn honked behind him, and he instinctively hit the brakes. He and Ruby lurched forward, held by seat belts, and he heard the distinct sound of a rear tire blow out. He steered onto the shoulder, the car listing like a three-legged dog. Sorry, I think we got a flat. Where'd you get your license? Sears and Roebuck? <laughs> 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 they sat laughing as the big rigs ripped by, rocking the car with their weight. He pulled a cell phone from his pocket. Well, I have to call the boss. 
They'll send someone out for you. I want to get there before dark. Ooh, that'll be tough. Be an hour before they get here. No, I don't have that much time. Well, I'm, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but if you raise a big enough stink, they'll put you up for free in town. I don't care a whit about the money. You get out there and fix that tire. Ma'am, that's, that's not what I'm supposed to do. I could get in trouble. Tell you what, Charlie. Fix that tire, and I'll tell you a secret. Something women don't want men to know about. He frowned, staring at his phone, then looked at the sky. Might come a storm. Biggest secret we got. It's about sex. He left the car, as much to get away from the topic as to change the tire. He removed the suit coat, folded it in half, and placed it in the trunk. He hoped some bonehead at the garage hadn't used a power drill to tighten the lug nuts. If he didn't get the flat fixed, he decided to stay out of the car. She made him nervous. While he worked, Ruby remembered her mother's excitement about the completion of the interstate. She'd called it the four-laner. Her mother expected all manner of wonderful things to arrive. Fresh fruit, fancy clothes, rice from China, maybe even the president himself. Now the interstate was just another old road with fading center lines and seams of tar, the center strip vivid with grass. Wind moved the tips of each blade like water. She felt the rear of the car shift as Charlie worked the jack down. A few minutes later, he slammed the trunk and got back in the car. He was sweating. She looked at the heavy sky and realized he was right. A storm was coming. Her years in the desert had diminished her skill at predicting mountain weather. Now for your secret. Who enjoys sex more, a man or a woman? I don't know. Look at me and do what I do. I don't really want to. I'm married. My gosh, Charlie, do you think I'm trying to seduce you? N not, not really, no, but you're acting a little funny. Just do what I do. Charlie looked at her. She put the end of her little finger in her mouth and made it wet. She waited while he licked his finger. She slipped her finger in her ear and moved it rapidly in and out. Charlie did the same. Now, which feels better? Your finger or your ear? He stared at his finger. The question had never occurred to him. And now he wasn't sure what the answer meant. Don't tell anyone. But now that you know, your wife won't ever have a hold over you. He wondered how she knew his wife had a hold. His wife had the habit of giving sex as a reward and keeping it back as punishment, sometimes for things he didn't know he had done or were supposed to do. He'd only had sex twice before he got married. The first time had been terrible, and the second girl never talked to him again. He had married his wife because she was experienced. Realizing this now, he felt as if his skin had caught fire, burned quickly out, and left him covered with ash. We best get going. I think it's raining over yonder. She pointed north, where the sky was black with faint gray lines slanting to the earth. He started the car and drove. Large drops of rain appeared on the windshield and ran swiftly up the glass, propelled by the car's velocity. He didn't seem to notice. Turn on the wipers. Something was distracting him, and she hoped he wouldn't wreck. The lush foliage surrounding Moorhead had been eradicated in favor of chain motels and fast food restaurants. Bright signs stood on tall poles like garish wading birds with spindly legs. Discount stores offered cheap goods galore. Ruby realized that her mother had been correct. The wondrous interstate had indeed connected Appalachia to the rest of the world, and the worst of it had drained right in. Bypass or Main Street? Railroad Street. Uh, I, I don't know that one. Why the trains come through? Well, there ain't a railroad no more. They took up the tracks when I was a kid. Well, I, I got some of the gravel in my driveway. Pretty good rock. Well, where it used to run then. 
Oh, all right. They call that First Street now. Moorhead's small population lived in the widest valley in the county, the town having spread like a lump of lard melting in a skillet. As they entered the outskirts, she searched for a familiar sight but found empty lots and new buildings. It's developed a lot here lately. Moorhead's getting big. All that means is new signs in old places. What's the biggest change you've seen? Selling water in plastic bottles. No, no, I, I meant around here. Don't they do that here? Well, yes, ma'am, at all the little stores. They headed east, and the storm struck suddenly with the force of an ambush. Rain pounded the roof and gusted against the windows. Thunder rumbled like a cannonade. Sheets of water covered the windshield between the quick movements of the wipers. Pull over a minute. I like this. They sat in the car without talking, listening to the batter of rain on metal. Ruby had forgotten the beauty and power of a thunderstorm roaring through the hills. In New Mexico, it seldom rained. She had learned of something called verga, which meant the water began to evaporate in the sky before it reached the earth. Occasionally, the moisture blended with the desert dust in midair and covered every surface with a thin layer of mud. She had felt that way since the doctor's diagnosis. The storm passed, the sky cleared, and Charlie drove. They passed the old voting house, several churches, and a line of trailer homes sitting on the old railroad bed. Above them were bare hills, logged for lumber and firewood. The general store was still there, dilapidated now and abandoned. Charlie stopped the car. They had reached the only fork the blacktop offered, and Ruby understood he was awaiting instruction. She had expected him to know the way to the Tanner homestead, the oldest in the county. But how could he, she thought, with renamed roads, bald-headed hillsides, and people living in trailers. Go left. Third holler up on the right. If we get to Carter County, you went too far. They drove deeper into the hills. The gray air was dim and fast. All the turnoffs were paved. He turned up a narrow lane and steered through the steep sloped hillsides topped by a narrow strip of crimson sky. Silver maples turned their soft bellied leaves to the breeze. Fatigue came over Ruby like a blanket made of lead, immobilizing her with its weight. Nausea flared and dwindled. Her insides felt sunburnt, a rising throb that made her dizzy. She knew a searing stab of agony would soon take her breath. Evenings were the worst. At the third holler, he carefully drove along a dirt road beside a fast-flowing creek. Ruby told him to stop beside a pair of massive white oaks the first familiar sight she had seen. She recognized the oaks, knew their contour, bark and shadow. She may have outlived town, but not the trees. This is it, right up there. Well, they ain't no bridge. Never was one. You just drive through the creek. Uh, I can't, ma'am, water's too high. Ruby looked through the windshield. Filled with runoff, the creek was out of its banks and into the road. The center moved very fast, carrying sticks and leaves. Ruby opened the door and stepped onto the road. Charlie joined her and they listened to the steady sound of rushing water. The air was still, the storm having left an implacable calmness behind. A whippoorwill called. Shadows cloaked the slopes. I'll, uh, I'll run you back to town and get yourself a motel. I swore I'd never stay in another one again. Why? Because I made my money in them. You owned one? No. Were you a maid? No. And no more questions, Charlie. Thank you for bringing me here. We, we can't get across that creek. I can. I've done it many a time. She moved to the edge where miniature whirlpools swirled with mud and twigs. Cold water flowed over her shoes. She stepped into her ankles. The far bank was nine feet away. No, I won't let you. 
She took another step and felt Charlie's hand pulling on her arm. She tried to release herself, but he was too strong, and she became angry for the first time in many years. She allowed him to tug her around until they faced each other. Let me give you something for your trouble. No, no, that's all right. We, we need to get out of here. Ruby closed her hand around the mace. She hadn't used it in a long time and hoped it was still good. I'd just as soon stay. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Ruby lifted the mace and sprayed him in the face. <laughs> he howled, moving backwards, then dropped to his knees in the mud. His eyes shut of their own accord. He began to gasp as if suffocating. You'll be all right in ten minutes. It hurts! Go home to your wife. She turned away, wondering how many times she'd said those same words to a stranger. She stepped into the water, moving carefully, feeling with her feet for the flat stones her great-grandfather had placed in the creek. The current was stronger in the middle, the water pushing her legs, making her calves ache. Her shoes slid along the heavy slabs of limestone. As she neared the bank, the water became shallow, the current softer. Charlie's eyes were clearing and his breathing had relaxed, but he was still scared. He should have known by her last name not to fool with her. Tanners were a storied bunch, the wildest of the woods. People had been glad when they died off, and he hoped she really was the last one. He opened his burning eyes to the old woman walking across the water. He shivered, aware of being alone in a lonesome place. He wondered if this holler was haunted, if she was some kind of ghost. No, she was a crazy woman with mace and money. He stood and got in his car and backed down the narrow road, thinking he'd call the sheriff when he got home. His wife wouldn't believe his story at first, but Charlie would convince her. He knew she had lost her hold on him. Ruby began walking the dwindled path that marked the way home. Leaves brushed the air as if the woods were breathing. She climbed the hill toward the fading sun. Hardwoods grew on the shade side of the holler with yellow poplar mixed in like stitching on a fancy shirt. Dusk was traveling fast between the trees. She was exhausted and her body ached. She rested at the spine of the land, looking at the remnants of the old home place, a stacked rock foundation streaked black from a fire that had long ago taken the walls and roof. The chimney remained, crumbled at the top. The yard and the woods ran together without border. Beyond the house, the family cemetery held a few stones like broken teeth. As a girl, she had often contemplated the dates of birth and death, separated by a hyphen, and wondered how such a short line could encompass an entire life. Now she understood the brevity. Two months ago, her doctor had laid out a future of radiation, chemotherapy, pain management, and death within six months. The diagnosis was too late for surgery. Her pancreas was nearly gone. Hospice care meant dying in a desert condo, a prospect with no appeal. She climbed the slope to hunt her spot, a low rock jutting out of the ridge where she'd come as a girl. A rip saw of pain staggered her and she held tight to a dogwood seeking a posture that would ease the anguish. When it passed, she sank to the earth and leaned against the tree, breathing hard. She pried open the bottle of painkillers and took them one by one, following each with a sip of bottled water. She hadn't eaten much, and the synthetic morphine swirled rapidly through her body, slowing her heart, making her breath shallow, abolishing every speck of pain. Her limbs were humming. With the last of her ebon strength, 
she removed her shoes and socks and pressed her feet into the rich decay of the forest floor. She couldn't tell where the earth left off and her skin began. Full dark arrived, the Milky Way a smear in the sky. An owl moaned low and near. Her thoughts hopped like a water spider on the surface of a creek. Life was overlap. People lived their lives simultaneously, but eventually everyone who ever knew each other was gone. She hadn't passed through life so much as life had passed through her. She felt empty as last year's bird nest. She recalled the sounds of a screen door closing, thunder along the ridge, katydids on a warm summer evening. She liked wild weather and soft dew, the evening hush of the woods, the gentle sound of water. Her legs lay stretched on the earth, but she couldn't make them move. A quick gust in the high boughs brought a spattering of water from the leaves above. She liked rain. She liked wildflowers. She liked four-foot icicles glistening in the sun and how a mockingbird kept track of each call in its head. From a deep well, it was possible to see stars at midday, and now... In the darkness, Ruby could see the sun blazing in the sky. She was of these hills. They had followed her everywhere, and now she had brought them home. The light expanded to a white glow. Before her stood a floating silhouette with the face of everyone she had ever known. She felt warm and lucky. In a final act of enormous will, Ruby parted her lips and spoke to the figure waiting in the darkness. I can spit a watermelon seed pretty far. 